Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here, and welcome back to the Peril of Assembline Isle, our solo RPG series in which we are using Scarlet Heroes as the base of our uh, rules, as a rule system. So sorry for the uh, to leave you guys hanging on this cliff for so long. Uh, it's just something that happened due, due to uh, some timing with some, some uh, personal things in my life. But uh, we are back, and we are ready to hopefully determine what will happen with our side quest here from our side quest rumor cards that we are using from folklore of the affliction and we have the layer of the earth mother or the hungry mother and uh, we are going to be trying to rescue the woodcutter's children from these two i'm calling them antlered goblins here and they are the henchmen of this hungry mother that has kidnapped the children because Stefan has uh, gone into a sacred forest and started cutting down some sacred trees and that is a big no-no. So one of the questions that I've been, oh, let's uh, back up just a little bit and do a little bit of recap. So um, if you remember, um, Ste um, our character Harlan and Rhea, they traveled to this fey forest and on the way to the forest, they encountered this kind of like uh, Taoist priest guy, and he was leading a small group of um, hopping vampires. And we were unsuccessful in hiding from them, but they paid us no mind. And they were heading towards, probably towards Halfen, the uh, main city. And so we are going to connect the um, introduction of the hopping vampires into the uh, cults scheming to combine those two elements mainly because I loved that the hopping vampires were rolled up randomly and I want to keep them in the game and I think that would be a really fun thing to do to have the cult trying to summon and bring about this hopping vampire horde infestation into the city of Halfen and that is kind of their their final goal so we're going to develop that more so one of the things is just with solo RPing, it's just do things that you want to do to have fun in your game, right? You could sit here and you could consult a thousand different oracles and a thousand different charts. And if something fun isn't coming up, just try to make up something fun, make up the plot, have the fun, and then play out the scenario that the plot dictates or something like that. So um, I think the hopping vampire connection with the cult sounds like a lot of fun. So that is what I want to do. Now, one thing that I have been asked a couple times is how to make combat more fun and dynamic. And you know what the answer to that is I'm not really sure. And I'm not really sure that I am the person to come up with a solution to that. Because in most RPGs, I'm going to say, I'm going to make a huge bold statement. I'm going to say 95% of the RPGs that I have ever played in my life, combat is almost always my least favorite part. Let's specify, let's be more specific. On map, moving tactical combat is my least favorite part. Because usually what that means is I move up, the enemy moves there, you know, in a group game, I wait 10 minutes for my turn, I roll a d20, I miss, and that's it. And then it goes around the table. You aren't moving around a lot on the board. Really exciting things aren't happening on the board, which is usually why in an RPG, I prefer more theater of the mind combat, where we can just kind of um, narrate what is going on based on really easy kind of positioning, being close, being far, being in melee range or, or uh, not melee range, which is kind of why I really like this system from Ancient Odysseys, where you just have a very basic uh, kind of a mind map of a positioning of where your characters are on the battlefield. You know, um, most of these games that we play on the Dungeon Dive don't have super dynamic combat. You know, Kingdom Death Monster is really the one game that has really dynamic combat. 
Uh, Dungeon Universe Solace also has some pretty dynamic combat, but that requires a, a just a lot of rules, a lot of things, a lot of um, little tiny detailed rules to keep track of. The way that Kingdom Death Monster solves that, I think, is by giving your survivors in that game have different ways that they can react to things that are happening on the battlefield. And that is really cool. But I don't want to develop a kind of system for that with Scarlet Heroes. So there are maybe a couple of ways that we could handle trying to make this a more dynamic uh, combat situation. One way that you might want to think about handling it is to have it be not a non-combat encounter, is how are these creatures going to react to me coming into their territory? Is there a way that you could say, okay, so I come into their, you know, I am intruding upon their um, layer here, their realm. So they are obviously um, not very friendly to me. But there is maybe a chance that we could parlay, that we could say, hey, um, you know, maybe we can work something out with the hungry mother and uh, have Stefan go out and plant some trees for her or, <laughs> or promise not to cut down her, her, um, her forest anymore. So there is a possibility that we could um, have a more of a charismatic conflict with these NPCs. So I'm going to turn to Scarlet Heroes on page 117 and the NPC. We're going to say that these are unfriendly NPCs. So these are unfriendly NPCs and we're just going to see how they are reacting to us. So we're going to roll 2d6 and let's see. Um, 11. All right. Uh, a 2d6 on 11 on this chart they are in grudging agreement okay so that is something that we could think about they are grudgingly agreeing to hear us out so we come in here and we see these antlered goblins here these antlered forest goblins and um, the earth mother does not immediately tell them to attack us okay that is one way that we could do this. I'm going to go through a couple of different ways using Scarlet Heroes. So in that situation, you may want to make a charisma check and maybe see if you can um, talk your way out of this situation. Another way that you could do this is you could also use Scarlet Heroes here and you could see the attitude uh, towards the hero. So the NPC's attitude towards the hero. This is a chart on page 79. This is a 2d8 roll. So let's see what would happen here if we just wanted to see what their initial attitude towards us was. Okay, so a seven. Um, this is says that they are looking for an excuse to prey on the hero. Okay, so they don't need an excuse. We infiltrated their realm. They are going to attack us. So that would go in, um, right away into combat. I want to do a combat encounter though. So I'm going to say that we are, I come in here, they are angry that we have invaded their territory. They think it is, you know, the earth, the hungry mother thinks that it is her right to take Stefan, the woodcutter's children because he has been chopping down her children, the trees, okay? So what we're gonna do though is um, there are these encounter twists that you can um, roll on to. So we can kind of see also what is their current purpose given to their location here. And that is a 2d10 roll. And um, let's see here, or oh, I'm sorry, not a 2d10, a 1d20 roll. So let's see if they have a, uh, a certain purpose here, uh, 18. Follow a rumor of a treasure in the area. Okay, so that doesn't really uh, work out in our situation here. But I just wanted to show that there are different ways that you can add a little, a little spice, a little element, you know, different charts that you could roll on to maybe determine some different things about the combat. So I do want to do a combat. So we're just going to have a straight combat uh, situation here. So that was all just kind of like what if scenarios. 
and we're going to play that. I do have Rhea here, and we are not going to be playing a party because I don't want to play a party, but she's going to be kind of a utility. And we will be able to, she will be able to heal us one time if we need it, okay? So that is going to be our utility here. So in Scarlet Heroes, the heroes always go first. And then rather than rolling up initiative, I'm just going to um, have it be very simple where we go, the two goblin, uh, antlered goblins go, and then the hungry mother goes. Now I have created a special power for the hungry mother to try to keep things a little more dynamic and she is able to summon up call up the vines and the vegetation of her realm and so whenever it is her, her turn and we are not in melee range she is going to summon up vines and we're going to have to make a um a DC 9 dexterity saving throw to dodge those vines or we're going to have 1d4 damage. And if we do dodge the vines, then we are going to have to move out of the way from where we are 1d8 random direction. Like we are jumping over the vines to um, avoid the damage. So that might be another way that you can make a, in a solo game, where you can make a combat more dynamic is just make one of the monsters have a power that causes you to react to it uh, in a certain way. So that is what we're going to do. So um, Harlan is going to go first. You can move up to 30 feet. So we're saying that each one of these squares is five feet. So we can move six squares. So he is going to move uh, one, two, three, four, right up to here. And we're going to attack that um, antlered goblin there. Okay, so the antlered goblins, they have a hit die of one, so they have one hit point. And so since that is equal to or uh, less than my level, I do get to roll my fray die, which is a d6. And we're going to roll a d20 for our attack roll there. And they have an armor class of six. So I'm adding a plus three to my attack. I'm adding a plus six. I'm adding a plus nine to this attack here. Okay, ooh, a 20. Okay, so that is a hit. So we do hit the goblin with our regular attack. Our fray die is a two, which is also one point of damage. And so we automatically kill this goblin there, removing him from the board. Now it is this goblin's turn. And he is going to move up to his uh, allotment, which is six. He moves there and he has an attack of antlers. He tries to stab us with his antlers, which gives him a, um, a plus one. And so our armor class is um, five. So he's gonna be adding a six to try to get a 20. And he rolls a 12 and so he gets an eight. So he misses. Okay, so now it is the Earth Mother's turn, or the Hungry Mother. I keep saying Earth Mother, uh, the Hungry Mother. And she is going to do her antler, her um, vine attack. So I need to make a DC, uh, we're gonna say it's a nine. I might've said eight before, but it's a DC nine dexterity. So I'm adding two here. I have to get a nine or higher. Um, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so I avoid the vines that she, and the vegetation that she summons up from the ground but I do have to jump in a random direction. That's gonna be one square. And we're gonna start from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that. Um, that is six, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So I have to jump one square back there in order to avoid those vines. Okay, so we are back up to the top of the round now and it is uh, Harlan's turn again. So um, Harlan is going to move up one and he is going to attack the um, antlered goblin there, rolling my fray die again. And I roll a 13 and a three. So the three is uh, one point of damage on the fray die. So it does hit uh, the 13, adding uh, nine is also a hit. So that goblin goes down as well. So now it is the hungry uh, mother's turn. And again, she is going to uh, summon her vines here. So we're looking at a DC nine and a 13. Okay, we avoid that, but I do have to jump and one, two. So I have to jump towards her 
to avoid the vines. All right, so now it is uh, Harlan's turn again. And Harlan is going to move up and he's going to attack the uh, Hungry Mother. Now the Hungry Mother, she has five hit dice. So I cannot use my fray die. So this is the first combat where we have not been able to use the fray die. Okay, so her armor class is uh, seven. And then I get to add a plus three. So I'm adding a 10 here and I need to get a 20 or more to hit. All right, so I uh, rolled a 10 and I'm adding 10. So I hit with a 20. So that was uh, very lucky there. And my short sword does uh, 1d6 plus two, which is four. All right, so that's one point of damage to the uh, hungry mother there. And so um, we're gonna keep track of her hit points using that d6 there. Now the hungry mother is a pretty um, nasty creature. I used a modified creature from Scarlet Heroes as the basis for my Hungry Mother. And let me see if I can find that real quick. Yeah, so I actually used the uh, Leng Siar, the Hungry Mother, as a kind of um, creature, as the basis for this creature. Um, I modified it a little bit but um, made her more like a fae type creature. But I really like the backstory here. Uh, these strange undead are the result of the childbirthing death of both a beautiful young mother and her child. And I, I felt that kind of fit thematically with her also kidnapping the children from the woodcutter. But she gets three attacks and she does um, two claws and one bite. Okay. And the two claws are at plus six. So these are uh, pretty much going to hit me no matter what, um, because my armor class is seven or five and a plus six. So she's adding an 11 to uh, these two attacks here. So, oh, that missed, that was a two. All right, so she's gonna add another 11 here and a 19 okay so she hit us with one of her claws and the claws do 1d4 damage so let's see if they do any damage here um a four yes yeah, so that is going to be one point of damage and i have misplaced my pencil so i'm going to keep track of harlan's damage using this die here so he has taken one point of damage and now she also gets a bite which gives her a plus six. So she's also adding a plus 11 to this bite here. And a one, she misses. All right, so she claws at me with both her claws and then goes in for a nasty bite and misses. So now it is my turn again. Her armor class is seven, plus my three is gonna be a plus 10 and a 10 and a 10 is 20. So I hit her again and I'm going to roll my damage here. And that is a two, so that's gonna be one more point of damage getting that up to two. So as you can see now, the combat has already become kind of stale. It's just her and me standing face to face, rolling dice to see who wins. And I can see how that is kind of boring. And it is also, it's a little boring for me to play. And it's also probably a little boring to watch. Um, so let's do, uh, we're gonna do one more round of combat on camera and then unless something crazy happens we'll i'll just fast forward to the end result so she gets uh, two claws so she's going to be adding an 11 to this attack um, another one so she misses her with one of her claws a five plus 11 is 16 she misses with that claw now she's going to do her bite adding an 11 and wow she missed all of her attacks unbelievable i thought she was gonna i thought I was kind of worried about her. I think I'm getting really lucky with my rolls though. All right, so um, let's go. I think we're gonna do the rest of this off. Nah, let's just do it. We'll just keep going. All right, so Harlan is going to attack again. Again, adding a 10 and he rolled a one. So he misses. All right, so now we're on to her turn. He, she rolls, have you ever seen a D20 roll more ones? Uh, this is absolutely insane. Um, a 15, there we go. So she finally hits me with one of her claws again, doing 1d4 damage. 
and that is a three. That's going to be another point of damage, up to two points of damage to Harlan. And now her bite, um, a two. All right, that does not hit. All right, so now we are going to go off camera because I don't want to just sit here and, <laughs> and roll D20s back and forth. So I'll see you guys at the end of this combat. Okay, so all the D20s have been rolled and it was very close. Uh, I was about to bring in Rhea to do a healing spell on Harlan because he took four points of damage. He only has five hit points, so he almost died. But all of those ones, I got really lucky with this D20. Uh, this was a blessed D20 on this game here. And he finally took down the uh, hungry mother and he was able to rescue the children for Steph and the woodcutter's children. They were back here being hidden in some vines. You know, maybe I had to cut them free and finally rescued them. And now we have to take them back to Halfen. And I think we're just going to uh, go back to the journey map here and um, have a trek back. Actually, let's do let's do a healing. Let's uh, let's say if Rhea can heal. So at the end of combat in Scarlet Heroes, you do get to heal two automatically, two points of damage from that combat. So I still have two wounds. So we're going to see here if Rhea can go ahead and heal us. So the healing spell that she has is called Hand of Merciful Sucker and it is a um it's an instant and it is a touch so she lays her hands on me hands of healing and it says the cleric's arts are useful in restoring the afflicted when cast on a subject this will cure two points of damage plus the result of a 2d6 healing dice and the way that um, healing works in scarlet heroes is you actually use the damage chart so you would roll both of these and um, a one would do no points of healing and a two would do an additional point, but this spell automatically heals for two. So Harlan is back up to full health after that encounter with the hungry mother. So we will uh, remove this uh, map chart here that we were using from Folklore the Affliction. Folklore the Affliction also does come with a lot of really cool standees that I'm not using. Um, Folklore the Affliction is kind of a, you could just buy Folklore the Affliction with Scarlet Heroes and have all of, almost all of the things that you would need in a pretty small package to run a solo RPG. And uh, I would, if you are thinking about getting into solo um, RP, I would consider combining Scarlet Heroes with Folklore the Affliction and I think you would have a pretty good time. So we are back to the uh, map here and remember our travel rules we're going to take our overland travel deck. So when we kind of a uh, reconfigure as I was saying in my last kind of recap video I was going to kind of reconfigure how the game was going to be played whereas I don't think I am just going to um, use this map much anymore except to come up with ideas for the different locations but I would say that we would come up with some kind of determination of how far or how close things are and um, draw a number of overland travel cards depending on how far something was something like that but we're going to uh, continue to play with my my rules right now where we can move up to four spaces and then we see how long that travel took so we need to move um, back to town here and i think we will go ahead and move in this direction we'll cross this bridge here one two three four okay so four so that only took three hours so that was a pretty easy day of travel 
So if you remember, on an easy day of travel, there's a couple things we can do. We can search our surroundings for something. Uh, we can stop and smell the roses, which is a character introspective moment, introspection. We can repair a thing, we can create a thing, or we can hunt for rations. I don't need to do that. And I do kind of like the stop and smell the roses. So I think I am going to do that again. And, um, just try to see if we can come up with some more interesting things that we can learn about, um, about Harlan Peters here. So let's see here, where is that? All right, so this is a D100 roll. So let's see what kind of question. If you remember last time, we learned a little bit about Harlan that he does have some trust issues. Okay, so let's see what this is going to be. Um, 87. What major arcana tarot card best represents your character? Okay, well, here's an interesting thing. I know nothing about tarot cards. And so I do actually have a deck on order because I want to uh, start using them in solo RPing. So I am going to just write a note down here to um, look into that, into a tarot to find out which Arcana best represents him. I don't know the answer to that right now. And one of the things that when you don't know is just say you don't know and come back to it. So we are going to have to um, look into a tarot deck. And I'm going to have to learn a little bit about tarot cards to figure out how to answer that question. Okay, so that was that day's travel. So that was an easy, an easy day's travel. We don't need to use any rations. We are good. So now we can continue moving another four spots. One thing we do need to do is we do need to keep track of our time here because uh, as we are away from the city, the cult is continuing to do their work. Okay. And so we're going to go one, two, three, and four. All right, so let's see what happened on that day's worth of travel. Okay, so that was 12 hours. And so according to our rules, if it is over 12 hours, it is a hard day's worth of travel. It is, if it is 12 or under, it's another easy day's worth of travel. And so we are just going to continue to have a nice leisurely stroll down this road here. And let's see if we can learn another thing about Harlan Peters. Well, let's say um, Harlan and during this night's uh, camping, Harlan and Rhea are talking and we're going to learn a little something about Rhea here. All right, 21. What do we need to ask Rhea? What does Rhea, does, does Rhea have any noticeable scars? If so, what are their stories? Okay, well, one thing immediately came to mind here is that you know she's part of this kind of indigenous race and is indigenous people of this land and she is she's um she's um, a half breed and i think at one point she was probably some kind of like slave or something and um she was captured by another people and probably put through the ringer for some amount of time and so she has some scars that she remember that she that are reminders of her time in captivity and so maybe there is another uh, tribe another group of people maybe another city out here that Rhea um, has animosity towards and so that could be something that could lead to an interest it's a little cliche but cliches are okay um, because they're easy to drop on and they are easy to use to further advancement in a plot like this. And so our last day's travel, we're going to go one and two and we safely make it back to Halfen. And we have a lot of information to tell. Oh, that's another day here. So we are back. We are back to actively in the town. We will be back to actively pursuing our investigation of the cult and the hopping vampires. 
We have all those information to share with the regulars at the tavern. I think our next um, adventure will be something to do with the uh, tavern and maybe we can finally get some answers from this really frustrating priest dude. But we will be back actively pursuing that um, mode of uh, adventure. And so we are, uh, we no longer have to just add a, uh, a victory point to the enemy's side for not pursuing that um, investigation. So, all right, well, that was our first overland um, adventure, our first wilderness encounter, our first traveling, everything is, um, went pretty well, I think. I, I enjoyed that and hope you guys did too. And um, next up, we'll see how probably, we'll, we'll probably investigate how the hopping vampires, this kind of evil, kind of Taoist black magic priest and the cult are working together. So uh, we can, uh, we're going to move more quickly into coming up to a solution to this um, urban adventure that we are currently on. So all right guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.